My name is Robbie Luckett. I'm director of the Margaret Walker Center and professor of history at Jackson State University. Today is August the 13th, 2021, 10 a.m. Uh, Central Time. I am joined by Dr. Dina Bennett. Dr. Bennett, for the purposes of the record, will you um, spell, state and spell your name? Yes, uh, Dr. Dina Bennett, D-I-N-A-B-E-N-N-E-T-T. And do I have your permission to record this interview? You do. Great. I want to begin with just some biographical information about you and your life. Can you tell us where you're from, where you're born, how you grew up, a little bit about your, your family, your educational background, those kinds of things? Okay, sure. Uh, I grew up in Topeka, Kansas, which is the capital of the state of Kansas. And it's also the place where Brown v. Board happened um, in 1954. Um, I grew up as one of two children uh, to my parents, Dick and Lillian Bennett, and I grew up in a musical household. Uh, we had a piano in the house, and my father's a musician. My grandfather is, was a musician as well. Uh, I had a, an interesting childhood. Uh, I grew up in Topeka, went to schools there and then went to college there at Washburn University, where I received a bachelor, bachelor's degree in communication studies. And then I went on to Kansas State University, which is in Manhattan, Kansas, the Little Apple. Uh, and I received a master's degree in college student personnel. So that set me off on a career in higher education. And I uh, went on to work at Bethany College, which is in Lindsborg, Kansas, also called Little Sweden. And there I was, um, I had a split position. I worked in the um, student life office as a minority um, student liaison um, with, with minority students and also in the admissions office where I was uh, an admissions rep uh, recruiting students of color for the school. And then from there, I went back to Kansas State University and began working with TRIO programs. I worked with Outward Bound. I worked with a program called Project Choice, which was a program that came out of Kansas City. Uh, Ewing Kaufman, who owned the, the Royals baseball team, Kansas City Royals baseball team, uh, there's a Kaufman Foundation, and the program was for underrepresented students, first generation. If you didn't get pregnant, if you didn't go to jail, <laughs> uh, he would pay for your bachelor's degree, your education. So we had a number of project choice. It was called Project Choice because of the choices the students would make or not make. And so I coordinated a, a minority mentoring program that included those students. Um, and then went on and did a number of positions in, in higher ed, interim, student life, um, assistant director, uh, coordinator of multicultural student organizations, where I worked with Black Student Union, the Hispanic organization, the Asian organization, Native American organization, um, and then decided that I had enough of working with students in that way. And I had turned 30. And I was like, let me try and do something that really taps into my passions. So I go back to music and I decide that I'm gonna go and get my doctorate. And I found something called um, ethnomusicology. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know it had a name, but when I described it to um, Dr. Portia Maltzby, who became my major professor, she said, it's ethnomusicology. That's what you're talking about. You're talking about culture. You're talking about um, music. You want to study the function and role of music in communities and how it works in people's lives or functions in people's lives. And so I resigned from Kansas State University, packed up everything and moved to Bloomington, Indiana to begin my PhD uh, pursuit in ethnomusicology. When I entered the program, 
let me say, I'll say this. I did, I knew I didn't necessarily want to be tenure track faculty. I wanted to work in the museum world or what we call public sector ethnomusicology. And so Dr. Malsby began to shape um, my graduate assistantship uh, opportunities around that interest and passion. So. So what was it in your um, graduate experience that um, and professional experience then that led you specifically to museum work? Yeah, so um, I think that I, I've always had this idea of wanting to preserve the history to um, I've always also had a um, a strong attachment to my elders. You know, I grew up in a Baptist church. Uh, a lot of people in the church were my mentors and were very prominent in the community. I mean, there are at least three schools, maybe four in Topeka that are named after these upstanding African-American uh, folks that were prominent in the community um, and really, um, made some contributions to the city. So, um, and my grandmother lived with us too. So I've always heard the stories and this and that. So this whole preservation of history has been really important to me. And I knew that I could do that in some way, shape or form if I was in a museum setting. And I did end up um, being like what we call a minister of music in the church. So I ended up playing playing a lot of songs that um, go back to the father of gospel music, Thomas Dorsey, you know, that whole preservation again. Um, and, uh, and also, um, you know, really learning a, a lot about how music works in the African-American um, life. So. Well, I'd like to explore that a little bit. I knew about your scholarly and ethnomusicological background. Um, but uh, your interest specifically in music uh, and, and particularly African-American music and just wondering um, about your specific experience in terms of uh, instrumental, vocal, what, what were you doing? Yeah, yeah well, you know, um, when I was growing up in Topeka, um, Topeka is also the home of Washburn University. And that's where I got my bachelor's degree, as I said. But at Washburn, it, Washburn University served as the venue for a uh, arts program that I participated in when I was a child. And the program was called the Melody Brown Fun Factory. And Melody Brown was a little girl. She would be my age now. She had lived who uh, was in my community and knew her parents was at her her father was actually a, a Methodist preacher in town, but she, unfortunately she died in a car accident. And so her parents started this fun factory, this, this arts program in her name. And the program was held at Washburn and you could take classes in uh, music, art, dance, drama. And so through that program, the people that ran the program could see that I had some ability, some musical ability. And so from that program, I got a scholarship to take piano lessons. And so this was probably maybe, I'm probably seven or eight or something. And so I took piano lessons from then on until I was a senior in high school. So the piano was really instrumental in my life. But when I got to fourth grade, I started to play the clarinet as well. And I played that until senior in high school. So I was in marching band, I was in concert band, I was in robed choir. So my primary instrument, I would say, would be piano. But in addition to my musical ability is my father. And my father, he and his brother had a band called, my father's name is Dickie Bennett. My uncle's Roland Bennett. The uh, band was Roland Bennett and the Rockin' Wailers. They made a couple of 45 records. 
My dad is the vocalist, the bass player, and the harmonica player. So that too, to, to have a father and an uncle who actually made 45 records back in the day, I want to, you know, that I wanted to know more about that. That's history too. That's preservation as well. Um, and so that all played into to my my love of music, my love of history. Um, we still have the 45 records now. My father has dementia, but sometimes we play those records for him. And, you know, there's a really great response to them because I know somewhere in there he can he can tap into the fact that that that's him playing and that sound is familiar for him. So so as I'm doing all of this band, this and that, I'm also in the church. So I start playing for the, the children's Sunday school class. Then I start playing for um, offering in church, the worship service. And then eventually um, I start playing uh, cantatas because my uh, minister's wife was classically trained. So she would direct the choir and then I would play the cantatas. And of course I could read music. So that was great. The other, the older pianist played by ear. So, um, and then I actually become the, the minister of music. And, and that really, I'm going to say that really helped, you know, I had gone away for a while to, to go and pursue the PhD, but coming back as I was, I came back to write it. I came back home. So I was finished as I was finishing writing it, I was the minister of music at church and being active in the actual subject area in which I'm writing and studying, I think really they reinforced each other if that makes any sense. And, and let me also say that in my church worship service, typically there is a selection before the sermon, before the minister comes up to give the message. A lot of times that space was saved for my father to do a solo. And so I would play behind him and we usually do a Thomas Dorsey song, Father of Gospel Music. So all of that has made me who I am today. <laughs> A point of personal privilege. I'm wondering, can I find your father's and uncle's music on like iTunes today? I want to listen to it. I don't know. Uh, I know you can on YouTube. Uh, a few years ago, um, there was someone who contacted me uh, and they wanted to know more about the group because the song had appeared on a compilation album over in London. And so I interviewed my dad and I wrote an article that is in um, a magazine. And so, but yeah, that's where we play it. When we play it for him, we go to YouTube. So Money Crazy is one. And then the other one is Tore Up. <laughs> Tore Up, pretty baby. I will look for those. <laughs> okay. So when you finished your graduate program, what did you do immediately out of graduate school? Yeah, so immediately I I am in Kansas. Uh, there are not many African American museums. Of course, I was looking towards those museums to work in. Um, and you know, when you when you go into ethnomusicology, that's very specific. Then when you go in ethnomusicology and want to be in museums, that's even more specific. Then when you are ethnomusicologist, you want to do museums and you want to do African-American music. <laughs> oh, you're real narrow. You're real specific. So I actually substituted in the public schools in Topeka for a while. A couple of gigs I got um, was uh, there was a music class. I, I substituted in more areas than music, but there was an opportunity to substitute in a music class for two weeks while a music teacher um, was on maternity leave. And then there was an opportunity to substitute for a week. I, I had substituted like one or two days for a teacher. And I had a card made that said, you know, like PhD candidate, you know, da, 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 da. And I left that on her desk. So then she calls me and she says, I'm getting ready to go out of town to some music conference. And I would really like for you to come in and do what you do. 
And I was like, oh my gosh. So I got to go into the school and write lesson plans on African-American music. Excuse me. Okay, someone's going by with a big uh, thing. So, um, and um, so I went in and, and worked with the children and we did all kinds of wonderful things. Um, uh, around African American music, so that was really awesome. So, uh, and then after that, I uh, the um, the headquarters for Payless Shoes is in Topeka, and so I worked in their law department for uh, several months. Um, and and uh, they have a law library there, so I'm sitting up with a PhD working in the law library at Payless. But then an opportunity came to go to the AAAM conference that year. So I go and I see someone I know, and here comes Dion Brown. And I look at Dion's name tag and it says BB King Museum. And I say, oh my goodness, a BB King Museum. I said, you know, I almost did my dissertation on Bobby Blueland who is a blues artist that was very close to to B.B. Uh, King. And they did a lot of, uh, of uh, they did a couple of albums together. And so I gave him my card. And so when I get back home, he emails me. And within two weeks, I am flying down to Indianola, Mississippi to interview for a director of education position at the B.B. King Museum. And uh, I'm off with the job on the spot and I take it. And then I moved to Indianola. Um, do you want me to continue? Or? Yeah, can you talk about your work at the B.B. King Museum? That sounds like a whirlwind sure. experience. You just came to AAAM. Do you remember what, which AAAM meeting that was? Yeah, that was, I want to say that might have been, was it Tallahassee? It might have been Tallahassee, which was because I began my job in September of 2011. So was 2011, was that Tallahassee? That sounds about right. I'll have to go look. Okay, I think so. And um, so at BB King, I was hired as the director of education. And so I went down there and um, my house was not ready. I was going to rent a house in Indianola, so I had to stay in in Inverness <laughs> for um, probably about six weeks. So I stayed there. Um, a, a lovely couple um, had a small house in the back of their house, and so I stayed there fully furnished um, for about six weeks, and then eventually moved into Indianola. So my work there was working with, of course, um, the educational and public program initiatives of the museum. What I found very interesting, and I said I come from Topeka, which is a Brown v. Board, you know, uh, city, um, is that the school system seemed to still have some segregated tendencies. There was Indianola Academy where a majority of the white students attended. And then there was Gentry High School where most of the black students went. And I was really shocked about that. That was just, I had kind of heard about that, but to actually be in a space and see that and feel it, feel that was very mind blowing. Uh, one of the initiatives that was just starting when I got there was a teen docent program called BB's Bridge Building Ambassadors. Um, it was modeled after the Holocaust Museum's Bringing the Lessons Home, where the young people talk about the Holocaust. So we were working with them on um, training and, and how, to, how to move a teen docent program forward. So I came in and we would meet on Saturdays, I think maybe two Saturdays a month. And um, I wrote the curriculum for it. Uh, we incorporated, of course, a lot about BB, BB's life 
and, and the Delta. And also we started to bring in some um, like professional uh, training for the students. We, d we did a, a class on resumes. Uh, we had someone come in and talk about leadership. But the whole idea was for these students to be able to be museum docents and to represent the museum at various functions. So, uh, of course, the following year, I was there in 2012, we had the B.B. King homecoming. And so we had some of our team docents work that we had them design their T-shirt. Uh, we took a field trip to Birmingham and we met with the, I think the program is called Legacy or Legacy Builders or something, but at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, they have a teen docent program too. So we took our docents to meet with them. So that was really awesome. Um, we also um, had an opportunity to go up to the United States Holocaust Museum or the Smith at the Smithsonian um, and participate in a leadership program. Um, they had spots for four students. Uh, I started off uh, with four. That's that's the time where we had to drive to Greenville to catch the plane, which would have taken us to Memphis and then from Memphis to D.C. And, and one of my students got on the airplane and was kind of having an anxiety issue. And so um, he had to he had to step off the plane and they told me if I stepped off the plane with him, I would have to wait for the next one. So I had to let him step off and call his parents to come get him. So I ended up going up to D.C. with three students, and that was very eye opening for them. We were able to listen to a Holocaust survivors um, um, story. Um, we also did a number of uh, visits to we did the Kennedy Center. Um, we did all the different uh, some of the Smithsonian's, we did some of the other things, World War II monument uh, uh, or um, a lot of those things. And, and some of those students, that was their first plane ride, um, <laughs> first time out of Mississippi. Uh, also, we were able to um, create or develop a summer program called the Art of Living Smart. And so that was centered around the arts, but also it had a, um, a living smart component in that, you know, Mr. King was a diabetic. And I think at one point, Mississippi had a very high obesity rate. So we would bring in a nutritionist to teach the, the uh, kids how to make healthy snacks, you know, in our kitchen, catering kitchen and this and that. And then we had a, uh, it culminated in a, 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 a final program where parents and, and friends could come out and see everything they learned and this and that. And, oh, and then we also, we, we uh, worked with the Delta State University. Um, they had like a mobile, kind of a mobile music um, a center where we could, where they came to us and the kids were able to create a theme song for the camp. So those are some of the highlights of Director of Education uh, <laughs> at BB King. And you've had a few stops since then. I'm wondering if you can talk about the trajectory of your career up to where you are now and the work you've done since leaving the BB King Museum. Yeah, so I left BB King and um, I went back, I came back to Kansas um, and it's interesting because I, I seemed everywhere I go, I seem to work with young people. But I actually go back into higher ed at this point at Kansas State University. I become the assistant director of the McNair Scholar Program. Ronald McNair was one of the astronauts that died in the Challenger incident. The program is to um, is for low income uh, and, uh, first generation students and working with them on preparing for graduate education. That fit very well with me because I had gone and done a PhD program. I'm first generation as well. So I stayed there four years, one of the best jobs I've ever had and uh, very rewarding. So did that. 
for four years and then said, you know, I want to go back to the museum world. So I ended up going to Washburn and being uh, the associate director of the Mulvane Art Museum on the campus. That was really great. Um, one of the exhibits that came shortly after I got there was for all the world to see visual culture and struggle for civil rights. And one of the main, um, one of the main pieces of that exhibition, of course, is the Emmett Till uh, photographs in Jet Magazine. Um, and so uh, a history professor on that campus teaches an exploring civil rights course every year. So this year, since I was there and with my background, he asked me to co-teach. So I co-taught the exploring civil rights class. And then during spring break, we took our students down to Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee. So we did the Emmett Till, um, the, well, the site of the grocery store. And we did B.B. Um, King Museum. We did Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. We did Stacks Museum. We did a whole thing. And so that still worked in, in my, you know, I'm still using everything that I've learned and, and you know, all my skill set and my expertise. And then from there, I um, go to the National Museum of African American Music, which is in Nashville, Tennessee. So this is a, a project that uh, had been going for some time when I joined the staff but they needed uh, someone with my expertise to come in and to really get the um, design and development and um, interactive pieces up and running. So I began to work with a, a team that actually included Dr. Portia Maltzby as the lead scholar, lead ethnomusicologist on the project. Also Dr. John Fleming as president uh, or director in, in residence. And then I worked with another curator um, who had an ethnomusicology background and a collections manager who had a public history background. And so for three years, we worked uh, with the exhibit design team and the interactive, uh, digital interactive team. And we created um, all the content for the museum, for all the galleries, for the introductory theater, um, what's interesting about that is that the exhibit design team was all white. And so they have worked, this particular uh, design team has worked on African American museums before, but this is a very specific museum. We're talking about African American music. And so we as content people not only had to work to put the museum together, but we had that extra layer of teaching the design team about this history. So one of the, the tables there, the interactives is Rivers of Rhythm, and it's a timeline from 1619 when the first Africans ar arrived on the American shores um, as slave, slaves or the enslaved um, and comes up to present day. And so we have all these significant moments and we've got songs, meaningful, significant songs tied to them. So we, we had to go back and forth with the interactive team. Now, what was really awesome is that they listened and they were interested in knowing this information and helping build these things to the best of their ability. So that was really wonderful. And some of them have come back now that the museum is opened and uh, can actually see all of these interactives come to life that we that were on paper, you know, and, and that were drawings and renderings. So uh, and I will say that that was my dream job. That was my dream job to be there and to to be engaged in that kind of work um, for that kind of, of institution. It's it's gotten rave reviews. People um, are really loving it. And this is the first time that there is an institution where you can actually not only listen to the music, but actually understand where it comes from. You know, what are those historical, social, economic, spiritual um, circumstances in which the music arose? So 
that's pretty interesting. We, we talk about more than uh, 50 genres and subgenres that African Americans have impacted, created, influenced within its walls, 56,000 square feet. So um, I left that museum in March, this past March, and I came uh, back home again. Uh, and I'm at the American Jazz Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, which is about an hour east of Topeka. And I'm the director of collections and curatorial affairs here. So I'm over uh, the permanent exhibition, the temporary gallery, um, all those those kinds of, of operations within a museum. It, it's nice to come home. Uh, I've been here before, around 2008, 2009. And also, oh, and when I was here in 2008, 2009, one of the changing gallery exhibits was from uh, the Smithsonian, 381 days, the Montgomery bus boycott. So we brought in Reverend Ralph Abernathy's widow to be our uh, speaker at the grand opening. That was really a phenomenal exhibition. Um, we just had in our change of gallery space, a Smithsonian exhibit called Billie Holiday at Sugar Hill. There was a photographer that was dispatched from Decca Records to follow her around for this week-long engagement at Sugar Hill in Newark, New Jersey, this club, Sugar Hill. So he took these wonderful photographs. So we had the photographer's son uh, come in and give us, a, give us a presentation. And so my work continues. This is also um, the topic of my dissertation actually wrote a dissertation on museums and the American Jazz Museum is um, is my topic. And I followed around the, uh, the director then, the founding director, Dr. Rowena Stewart, and have a lot of insight into how this museum was built and what kind of work she tried to do to make this uh, uh, a really wonderful space for the public. Can you tell us a little bit more about what exactly you do on a day-to-day -day basis in your role and what some of the misconceptions and un unknown aspects of that work is? Oh, okay, sure, yes. So um, let's see, so for instance, right now, uh, we are redoing our website. <laughs> so um, I have some, um, some language, specific language that I would like for us to use when we talk about collections that should go on our website. So I'm reviewing that. Um, in our changing gallery space right now, where we are located, we are located in the historic 18th and Vine Jazz District in Kansas City. In our building, we share it with the Negro League Baseball Museum. We share the space, the changing gallery space, which is where we bring in rotating exhibits every three to four months. We share that with them. And we let them have it. That's we let them have that space, usually around the months where baseball is really, you know, active. So as I said, Billy Holiday just left a couple of days ago. So now it's time for Negro Leagues to come in and they are bringing in a Smithsonian exhibit on Latin baseball. But um, what I've had to do since um, Billy was leaving is I had to make sure I, I work with two, two, um, two staff members in collections, a registrar and a collections associate. And so we have had to um, make sure that we took down the Billy Holiday exhibit the appropriate way. Then our registrar had to do condition reporting to make sure that everything was okay, or if it's not, she has to document that. So I'm overseeing those things. Um, I'm overseeing uh, yesterday when I came in the delivery truck or two days ago the delivery truck was already here they came early so i had to make sure that i signed off you know that everything was okay once they packed up the exhibit so there's some administrative work here um also we are working with disney right now uh they have an exhibit on soul 
their animated feature that's about a jazz artist, jazz pianist. And so that exhibit has different jazz cities represented. And they also have a bunch of um, artifacts on loan. You know, like they for for the the New Orleans, they have a New Orleans panel that talks about New Orleans jazz, and so they have a sax, um, a trumpet on loan from the Louis Armstrong House Museum in Queens. Um, my director, this was before I got here, she loaned the Charlie Parker plastic saxophone. That is our prized possession. She loaned that to them. He played it in 1953 in the Jazz at Massey Hall concert, which is considered the world's greatest jazz concert ever. So she sent it there. It came back to us week before last. My registrar went down and got it and, came and brought it back. So we're gonna put it back in its case and never loan it again. Uh, but I say all of that to say that uh, our work with Disney is they want to bring the exhibit here in our changing gallery. And so, um, this is the interesting thing, though. Even though my director took the saxophone down to Disney, there was not a panel on Kansas City. Now, historically, there are four major jazz cities, New Orleans, Kansas City, Chicago, and New York. Well, Chicago, New York, and New Orleans are all represented with a panel down at Disney in this exhibit. In addition to Los Angeles, and San Juan, Puerto Rico. The curator at Disney said, well, it came down to Kansas City and San Juan, Puerto Rico, and we went with San Juan because of the Latin tinge, as, as Jelly Roll Morton, the Spanish tinge, called it. So Kansas City does, didn't have a panel, but yet my director took the saxophone down. I'm saying all that to say that now that it's coming to us, the exhibit, they want to create a Kansas City panel. So I am working with them on that. You know, I'm like, I'm an ethnomusicologist, you know, so let me work with your script writer on writing the panel for Kansas City. So I'm doing that. So we've been on the phone and I've seen several drafts. So that's part of what I'm doing. Um, also, um, bless you. Um, let's see. Um, other things, you know, some of our exhibit, we will be 25 years old next year. And we have 25 year old technology. So we're going through a strategic planning process right now with Lord Cultural Resources. So I'm very involved with that. And, uh, you know, being an ethnomusicologist in this space is great because if, if and when we redo the exhibits, I'll be doing the same thing I did in Nashville. <laughs> working with designers, giving them the content, laying out the, the history um, and, the, and that type of thing. Also that changing gallery space, we have a dehumidifier in there because we have to keep a certain temperature and it collects the moisture. So we have to empty that. Our registrar empties that on a regular basis twice a day. She's not here today, so I'll be doing that. So, um, those are some of the, the things that I've been doing. <laughs> a little bit all over the place, as is the, the case often in the work that we do. You have to be willing to do just about anything that's needed, right? You do. You do. And I told the, the young ladies that I work with that, you know, I will never ask you to do something that I wouldn't do myself. So, you know, if you need me to help do, you know, they take the initiative on several things, but if you need me to pitch in, I'm here. You know, if you need me to help lift up the glass for the putting the Charlie Parker saxophone back in its case, you know, let me know. I'll be up there. So. You mentioned um, various uh, topics that are um, related to civil rights and other issues. Of course, we live in a world that's in incredibly polarized right now. And I'm wondering how you and your museum deal with topics that may seem to some to be controversial or, or complicated in the work that you do. Yeah, well, since I've only been here since March, um, we've not really dealt with anything uh, along those lines. Um, we have some other battles that we're dealing with 
this is a, a popular district. Um, we have a blue room that is connected to the museum. It is a, a functioning club, jazz club, and also it is an exhibition space. So due to COVID, it's, it had been closed, but in this past June, we opened it for two days a week, Friday and Saturday nights. Well, also the city wants to do this event called First Fridays. So they block off the streets, 18th Street, and then they have vendors and large crowds come. For a couple of weeks, the crowds were so large that the musicians that needed to get into the Blue Room to set up to perform could not make their way through or unload their equipment because of the crowds. And it also affected the public attendance in terms of the public coming in to listen to those musicians. So, uh, and they start blocking off the streets early and uh, earlier this summer, we did have someone that was killed in the district. He, this wasn't his main job, but he was a security guard at one of the, we have a couple of clubs, a couple of restaurants, uh, Alvin Ailey dance troupe down the street. Kansas City was another home for Alvin Ailey outside of New York. So that those kind of things have been um, in the news um, we're dealing with in our own backyard. So um, it's 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 a problem, but um, I haven't yet dealt with those larger issues as of yet. I do foresee us doing that. We have a new director. She's been here for um, probably about a year and a half. So, well, and it sounds like you've had um, some challenges uh, there, and I know that COVID nineteen yes. has been uh, <laughs> one of them. I'm wondering how your work has evolved to meet the demands of this ever changing modern world, especially in the in the COVID context. Yeah, well, you know, when I started in March, the museum had opened um, had opened back up. I think it was closed for a while. We never have uh, strayed from our mask policy. We do have that going on. Um, and so we provide masks for people that come in and do not have one. Um, now, it does pose some challenges because we have interactives. Negro Leagues does not, but we have interactive. So that means that we need to go in and we need to um, to clean. We, we do provide, it's optional, we do provide plastic gloves if people want to use those. Um, we also, one, one issue that we have is the food and drink policy here. Because we have the functioning club that only serves drinks. If we have something going on in the club, so, so there's the atrium area, there's the museum exhibits, there's the club. If we have something going on in the atrium and the blue room is open, people want to bring their drink through the exhibit out to the atrium. No. <laughs> um, and so I've had to hang in the exhibit and tell people, no, you have to finish your drink in the blue room before you come through here and this and that. So we've got, we've got those things going. I even forgot your question, Dr. Luckett, apologies. No, it's okay. <laughs> but, the challenges of COVID in this world. Oh, the COVID. oh yes, that too. You mentioned to the, um, uh, yeah. the interactives. I'm guessing you're talking about instruments or some kind of simulation of instruments that people can play. What type of interactives? Well, yeah, we have a number. See, this is the thing, and I'll talk to you offline about it, um, that my dissertation explores. We are called the American Jazz Museum. When we opened, we were called the Kansas City Jazz Museum. But our name changed to American Jazz Museum, which should imply that we're everything jazz. We are not. We are focused on four jazz masters. Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, and our native son, Charlie Parker. 
So for each of those exhibits, we have um, stations, listening stations that have a sound shower where you can select musical. We have it has flip boards with information about each artist and, and their their music and artistry, and then you can um, select different songs from each artist. So those interactives. Then we have a little studio area where we talk about rhythm, melody, and harmony. Melody, harmony, rhythm, yeah. Uh, and so uh, that is kind of a mixing board and you can kind of create, and we actually still have headsets for those. So we got, a, we got rid of the headsets on the listening station, so we have a sound shower or a cloud. But for the, the studio area, we still have some headsets. And so that's a very hands-on thing too. So those are the interactives. Thanks for that uh, clarification. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, just shifting gears a little bit uh, and turning towards the Association of African American Museums. You mentioned uh, that really your your visit to the conference when it was held in Tallahassee was uh, an, an entree for you into the field. I was wondering if you might talk a little bit more about your relationship to the organization and AAAM. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, right now I am a board member. I was uh, nominated or voted into the board last year, and I'm very proud of, of being able to serve in that capacity. Um, my relationship with AAAM began around 2003. I was still writing the dissertation, and I attended in Ch Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and then uh, have attended, I haven't attended every year since then, but I think the next year was 2005 and then this and that. And it was really funny because um, a lot of people would see me and they knew I was a student. They knew I was interested in museums and <laughs> uh, Joy Bailey Bryant, you know, Joy from Lord Cultural Resources. She was like, oh, Dina, you're going to get you a job. And I'm like, yes, I'm going to get me a job. And uh, but it's been very instrumental in just keep keeping up with the work when I was in Tallahassee, Dr. Stewart, who is from Florida and was retired, attended, and I was able to spend time with her. And that was very meaningful. Um, it is, I have presented there. I've presented on the National Museum of African American Music, which was really a, a wonderful experience to share, you know, the, the news about this exciting museum that was coming. Um, and that would now be a part of AAAM as well. So I was even a Burroughs Wright Fellow. So that was really, that was when it was out in um, North Carolina, like Durham, Raleigh. And so, and, and so I attended AAAM when Dr. Burroughs was still around. She had her little tennis shoes on and everything, and <laughs> all of that. And so, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am probably. Well, I, I may, yeah, but, but being able to be connected to uh, colleagues who are working in some of the same kind of area, areas that I'm working in, you know, with African American history and culture and, you know, has been really uh, affirming. Uh, it's a supportive environment. It's um, it's been really awesome, and I would not not want to be a part of it in some um, in some way because it's a phenomenal organization, and it has really grown and is very strong. Um, I mean, back in two thousand three, you know, it still was trying to find its way, but now it's really up and going, and so I'm very proud of that. You've mentioned a number of people who've influenced you. I'm wondering um, who are the folks that you consider to be the most impactful on your career in this field and, and what they did for you? Yeah, I would probably say Dr. Rowena Stewart, you know, who is a Black museum pioneer. Um, and I would say Dr. Portia Maltzby, my um, former professor, and working alongside her on the National Museum of African American Music in Nashville was really interesting because our relationship changed. And now I'm her boss. 
because <laughs> she was a co contracting, you know, a consultant. Uh, and, and, and her really being able to see me in the field doing these things uh, was really cool too. And, you know, I didn't really realize it until she introduced me as I was the first student, the, her, the first, let me get it right. I was the first one to write a, a dissertation on museums that she has had. And she's trying to get me to turn it into a book. So I am considering that. Uh, I would also say Juanita Moore. I don't know if you know Juanita. She was here at the um, American Jazz Museum and then went up to Charles Wright. But I learned a lot from her. I did an internship here. I did my field work here. We do field work as ethnomusicologists. We're like anthropologists of music. So I spent a year here interviewing different folks. Um, I would also say Dr. Kathy Green back at Kansas State University, uh, who was my supervisor in the Ronald McNair program. So yeah, I would say Dion Brown as well. I would name Dion. So, and of course, all my folks at the church, and you know, they never stopped praying for me. Um, my minister would always be uh, very concerned about my progress in the graduate program. And, um, you know, it took a little longer than I think he thought it should take, but I got it. And uh, so, <laughs> but yeah, those are some of the folks that have been instrumental and of course my supportive family. What's your vision for the future of the field? For the vision of the field? Yeah, what's your, what is your vision for the future of the field? For the future of the field, the museum field? Black museums specifically, but Black the museum field museums in general? Well, you know, I don't know how honest to be in this interview. But for me, I have worked at three African-American museums. B.B. King Museum and Delta Interpretive Center in Indiana, Mississippi, under Dion Brown, who had museum experience coming out of Wichita, Kansas, uh, the Science Museum. I have worked at the National Museum of African American Music, whose CEO is Henry Hicks, who has no museum background, who has no nonprofit background. Very difficult and challenging to work under someone like that. Um, not always supportive of our work, getting in the way of our work, um, not understanding the scholarly, um, the scholarly, um, what's, what's the word, uh, not pursuit, but the, the scholarly um, foundation that, that was needed to put it together. And then I have worked here at the American Jazz Museum and I've worked under Rowena and I've worked under Juanita. Uh, right now working under Rashida Phillips, who is coming to us or came to us from Chicago. I think it's the Old Town Museum or something like that. However, um, I, I wanna preface my comments with that, that context because I feel like African-American museums or at least the ones that I've worked in uh, being the American Jazz Museum and the National Museum of African American Music, need to stop hiring folks that do not have the appropriate backgrounds. I have, because that is not advantageous to the organization, nor is it advantageous to the staff. And so um, that that is my thing is that we have got to get qualified people. And not only these executive directors and CEOs, but we have also got to hire the right folks in these other positions, you know. So right now, dealing with some folks who don't have the background to be museum educators, that's a problem. And, you know, you always want to come to me. Well, I can't always save you. You know, I got, you know, I, and I'm over in collections, but but I do know about these other things and I can assist, but I can't take it over and do your job for you. So, you know, thank you for allowing me to be able to express that. But so my my 
my uh, vision for the future is that we hire, you know, continue to hire competent folks that we continue to nurture our young people who are coming through the ranks. Uh, one of my um, mentees, if you will, or uh, Dr. Jacqueline Hudson, she just received her doctorate coming out of Bowling Green State University up in Ohio. She will now be going over to the National Underground Freedom Center to work. And so I have stayed um, in touch with her very closely and feel very connected to her and um, her contributions or future contributions and, and what she will be able to offer that institution. So, and I'm very proud of that. So I think we need to continue to nurture these young folks that are coming through and um, make sure that they get the right opportunities. Right now, my collections associate, I am. I have her signed up for a developing exhibitions class through the American Association for State and Local History, a class that I just took myself this spring, even though I just built a whole museum in Nashville. <laughs> I wanted to take the class. So, yeah. Well, building on, that, building on that fault, I'm wondering what recommendations you have for people who want to enter this work. I am teaching this intro to museums class at Jackson State uh, this yes. semester. Awesome. So what would you say to the people um, who are out there who want to enter into the museum world? Yeah, I would definitely say that find a mentor in the field. I think that would be important. You know, someone who's actually out there doing the work that you see yourself doing. Then I would also say um, to get in the right kind of program, you know, whether it's a museum studies program or a public history program or some combination of the two, you know, my entry into museums has been ethnomusicology. Um, you know, there may be history programs as well that would lend themselves to, to museum work very nicely. Um, so get into the right programs and look for internships opportunities. I know that can be dicey because sometimes internship opportunities are not paid. So, but I think internships can speak um, volumes. Also, I would say if you need to volunteer, if you can volunteer, that that would be great. I volunteered at the Kansas, while I was writing the dissertation, at the Kansas State Historical Society. And we have something called the Topeka Jazz Workshop, which is a jazz band. So while I was there, they had donated their materials, you know, and their and so for me to volunteer and to be able to work on the Topeka Jazz Workshop donation was so perfect as an ethnomusicologist. So I ended up creating a finding aid. I didn't even know what a finding aid was, but I learned how to create a finding aid for that particular collection. So that was very instrumental for me. I'd go every week and, you know, so volunteer opportunities are very, uh, can be very significant as well. Well, we're reaching the very end of this conversation. Do you have closing thoughts or comments or things that we didn't get a chance to talk about that you want to explore a little yeah. bit further? Um, you know, I've, I've found myself, um, I'm glad I'm in the field I'm in, not only as an ethnomusicologist, but, you know, like I said, I've been able to teach a civil rights course. I've been able to live in the Delta, uh, an experience that as an African-American person myself and as an ethnomusicologist who studies African-American music, very important to be in the land where the blues began. Now, what I didn't say is that my father and I have a deep connection on the blues. Because not only was gospel played in the house, but blues was played in the house. And when you listen to one of his songs, he sounds like Jimmy Reed on the harmonica. So being able to go to the B.B. King Museum and live in the Delta, that's why I went to study ethnomusicology was because of the blues. I actually went to the University of Massachusetts Amherst because Dr. Stephen Tracy is there, who wrote a book on Langston Hughes and the Blues. And they had just started a PhD program when I went up there in the late 90s. So I went up there, visited the program, 
went to dinner with Sonia Sanchez, some other folks. And then I came down in the elevator with Vincent Harding. You know Vincent Harding? He, I told him what I wanted to do. He said, have you heard of Indiana University? Dr. Portia Mosby. Now I'm working at Kansas State. I'm the coordinator of the multicultural student organizations. For someone to say Indiana, that would be like somebody saying to you, have you tried Kansas State? I'm like, Indiana? I go back and call Dr. Mosby. And she says, oh yeah, that's ethnomusicology. See, that, this is where you need to be. I had missed the deadline. They said, if you can get all your materials in, blah, 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 blah. I got them in, was accepted. University of Massachusetts didn't accept me. Only applied to two. You know, working with McNair students, we tell them to apply to six to 12. I only applied to two. What's interesting about Dr. Mosby is that she's from Florida, but she came up to Kansas to go to undergrad in Atchison, Kansas. My mother's from Atchison. So anyway, just saying that I have been able to touch a variety of, of areas within African-American um, history and culture that I think have, have broadened my scope and allowed me to be really transitional within the field. And I'm, I'm grateful for all of that and all the people who have helped to, to make those opportunities possible. So definitely find mentors out, mentors out there and people you can trust. And, and even if you need to shadow them for a while, try to do that because it's really important that people um, know you and, and go to triple AM conferences if you can. Apply for Burroughs Right if you need some fi um, some finances or financial help. Because it's nothing like being in the space and um, interacting with people who are actually doing the work. Dr. Dina Bennett, thank you very much. For oh, I can't hear you. Oh, okay. You got me now. I got gotcha. you. Thank you, Dr. Dina Bennett, for joining us for this conversation. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you, Dr. Luckett. Appreciate the opportunity.